NIA and DSS by appointing two key officials. In the course of our discussions, we'll have the pictures of the newly appointed leadership men at the hands of the affair on screen as well. We'll also take a listen to one of them and have a reaction to a video that has now gone viral, where apparently staff of the DSS threw a party at the office, rejoicing the resignation of their former DG. Now, joining us on the program would have one guest in studio, the other <coughs> virtually, both security analysts and consultants, to help us understand this agenda setting in terms of what this appointment means for the security architecture in the country, particularly under the leadership of the NIA and the DSS. Now, if we have virtually joining us, let's see if we have established a strong connection with Dr. David Okro. Uh, whilst that connection is still buffering, let's uh, also do well to introduce a regular on the program, but not on the newspaper review segment this morning. However, joining us for a special feature is Dr. Steve. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Thank it, you for having me. It's good to see you. Yeah. Now, let's start with this reappointment, the mm -hmm. rejigging now. A lot of persons have pointed to some of the interagency scuffles, particularly between the DSS and all the sister agencies over time and without statements being issued by the non-resigned DG, where the calls that they ought to have been a better coordination or into an outfit that prides itself in going about his activities more secretly. Let's review the leadership before we now look at the new appointment. In your case, to review the activities of the DSS prominently with the scuffle with the FCC in Lagos and also at the court following the MFLA gate saga, mm. how would you sum up the DSS in recent time? <clears throat> yeah. Um, let me just give a, a background of DSS, NIA, and the likes. Uh, you know, they, they were established in 1986. Uh, the three agencies, security agencies, or intelligence agencies, that's the DIA, NIA, and DSS. They were under the National Security Organization, that's NSO, before 1986. Then the uh, former uh, president or head of state, Brian Babangida, now established uh, these three security agencies out of uh, the NSO. You know, and uh, the three intelligence agencies have their mandates clearly spelled out. The DSS has to do with uh, domestic intelligence, uh, domestic, uh, seeing that the Federal Republic uh, is that they, they try to see how to against um, threats, domestic threats, you know, and all that against the Federal Republic of Nigeria and some other things. And also, don't forget that the DSS also has part of its mandate, which is um, up, upload upload and enforce the criminal laws of Nigeria, you know. So I am trying to bring this back so that we know where we are headed. Uh, to see the rules, the play, uh, the reason for establishment, yes, the roles, the <coughs> mandates, mm -hmm. and the activities. Exactly. So when you begin to look at the activities of the DSS under the immediate past uh, DG, for me, the man was called from retirement, you know, to come and see how to uh, bring his world. That's of talking about Al Haji Yusuf Magaji Bichi. Which, yes, to bring his wealth of experience. He was a former DSS officer. He was called from retirement to come and bring his wealth of experience and all that. And if you ask me, the man uh, has done well, you know. Yeah, we saw that uh, the DSS under him had a, a new face, you know. But talking about uh, him exiting or retiring or resigning or whatever, I want to talk about coordination, synergy between security agencies and all that. Well, with the assume there must be because some cordiality for effective uh, delivery of service that they are supposed to do. I, I think that is uh, the responsibility of the National Security Advisor, the Office of the National Security Advisor, because it's the Office of the National Security Advisor coordinates all the uh, activities amongst the security agencies and other. But for me, I, it was the coincidence was too glaring to see the two heads resigning at the same time. Something must have uh, prompted their resignation, you know. But when I saw that they resigned, I I tried to dig into the matter to truly know what happened that they told them. What kind of coincidence was that, you know? But I discovered that um, the 
the, the uh, have gone DG of the DSS. They, they talked about the subordination to the Office of the National Security Advisor. Now, now this is a strong point that you've raised allegations of insubordination, or insubordination to the Office of the National Security Advisor. At this point, let's see if we can now have Dr. Daniels Okoro, who's supposed to join us virtually, if that connection is established. Can you patch Dr. Daniel through? And let's get his thoughts on this development as well. Hello, Dr. Daniel. Good to see you and welcome to the program. David. Can you hear us? We can see you, but we're having trouble hearing you. If you can hear us, Dr. David, can you hear us? Whilst that connection is being sorted out. This issue, based on the allegations of insubordination to the Office of the National Security Advisor, which you presume that might be one of the issues that fueled the resignation mm. of both of them, you think, whilst it's leveled against one. Mm. Now we're talking about the activities of the DSS, which have largely explained the NIA is another one that's supposed to be somewhat in secrecy. Nigerians don't necessarily see them, mm. but we actually benefit a lot from the intelligence they share. Yes. No, the NIA has to do with uh, foreign intelligence, you know, and also counter uh, terrorism, intelligence, and all that. Uh, for on the part of the NIADG, you don't. F you okay, don't forget that I said they are both of them resigning at the same time. Called for some kind of a, a suspicion, you know, beyond whatever uh, we were hearing. And from the part of the NIADG, uh, I, I think they said uh, it was failure on his part, not for him not to be able to get uh, the. Intelligence that led to the seizure of uh, the jets. Yes, you know that uh, the case was in court. Uh, his office would have known the next action to be taken before the embarrassment, the the seizure cost the, the the mission or the country. You know, so I, I I love what the president has done. You know, I, I want to see that it goes beyond just these uh, security agencies. When an agency of government fails to deliver on the mandate they, they've been established, you know, to do or perform in this country, the heads should be fired. You know, I mean, it's not time for pampering anymore. You know, I think we are in a season where we should truly see accountability, transparency, and service delivery. You know, in all the agencies of government, it's not just for the security agencies alone. Now the heads are taking the brunt, you know, they've taken the, the failure of their other officers about that, you know, to see that they exited the office. So let us see that it is also it cuts across other agencies of government. Then with that, the heads of all these agencies will sit up, you know, to, to truly perform the tax they've been saddled with to do. Now, Dr. Steve Okori believes that this rejig would see a more ardent approach to tackling Nigeria's insecurity challenges as it concerns the developments under the respective agencies, the NIA and the DSS. Now, in a statement by President Bola Metinibu's uh, media person, uh, during a lally, uh, published the appointments, and uh, we looked at the appointments of Ambassador Mohammed, who had an illustrious, an illustrious career in foreign service since joining the NIA in 1995. Now let's look to see if we can re-establish connection with uh, Dr. David Okoro. Hello, Dr. David, are you still with us? Well, if you can hear us, and I'm sure your connection is stable, uh, do want to check that you're not muted at your end, and if you're not, let's have your take on this development. seems to be some connections with the audio. We'll come back to you in a bit and, and see if you can figure out where the mic was muted, if you can unmute yourself and have your take on the program. But let's also work with some of the back-end support we have at this point of the program. We'll take a listen to comments as made by Ambassador Mohammed, and uh, following his appointment, the promise of rejigging the NIA for better intelligence gathering, which Dr. Steve has a set that might have prevented the season of the Jets. It's a routine thing. Um, 
from time to time to brief Mr. Pre President uh, on situations, on issues, and uh, today is no, uh, 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 it's no exception. Uh, after the briefing, actually, I tendered my resignation, and Mr. President graciously approved and accepted the resignation. I thanked him uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to serve Nigeria under his transformational leadership um, for a period, for an extended period of 15 months, which is very rare, by the way, uh, to serve, to have the opportunity to serve uh, two presidents at a stretch at a goal. So I thanked him very well, and I promise to remain professionally as we professionally dedicated to our country and to noble causes. All right, sir. So, uh, in this uh, setting of Nigeria, it's rare to witness something like this for someone of your caliber to tend their resignation. Nigerians uh, will be curious to know why you are doing this. Um, there are quite a number of reasons one will do that, some personal family issues, but nothing very serious actually. And uh, uh, the friendship will, co will continue. Um, I discussed with Mr. President, he understood very well, and uh, I promised to remain seized with issues and the security situations of the country. So what was uh, the reaction of Mr. President? Um, I, I think, I think um, uh, it's not for me to say this, actually. Uh, probably I'll be preaching a protocol, but uh, maybe the NSA and uh, or Mr. President himself will say it. But what I can tell you is that uh, I'm very, very grateful uh, for the opportunity that the President gave me, actually, to serve the country and uh, his leadership. The encouragement I got, uh, uh, the confidence he had in me and in my service, uh, the opportunity to listen to me, uh, to read our briefing notes and our advices and so on. I think this is, this for me is, uh, uh, is everything. And uh, um, I've had uh, the opportunity to mentor uh, officers and staff um, for all the period that I've been DG. This is the seventh year, by the way. And the opportunity to mentor younger officers to come up. And now uh, uh, we have a lot of many officers who can do this job and do it excellently very well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now the outgoing for, uh, DG of NIA, Al Haji Ahmed Abu Bakr Rufai, there speaking with correspondents at the State House, uh, following his decision to resign and listening to comments he made notably on having served two presidents in Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, he still didn't quite give a specific reason as to why he had resigned on Saturday. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of longevity, his appointment since 1995, many would say, might be a logical reason to say, I have served in capacity of two presidents tenor. That's a lifetime for some persons, and he's probably just stepping down to allow for new hands to assume the, the, st the saddle at the NIA. Yeah, yeah, he said, um, I think he mentioned, I heard him said uh, personal reasons. reasons and from family issues and all that. You know, you know, when you are asked to resign, for me, he was asked to resign. Let us be straightforward and open about this. Let's do it for any uh, secrecy here. He was asked to resign. And, uh, uh, and he said family, personal issues and all that. I think these things are best known to him. You don't expect him to come from and begin to say on national television that uh, he resigned due to failure on his path or in his, uh, failure in his uh, responsibilities as a DG of NIA. It wasn't for him to, for him to get that intelligence, you know. NIA, the jets will be seized. Exactly. And I, we have them officers posted in foreign, they go on foreign posting, there are a whole lot of them there. So one or two of them outside there that were supposed to feed him here, uh, the headquarters about the information over there, must have failed in this other responsibility. So, so you feel yeah. there's more like mutual consent to save face for the embarrassment of having seized the jets? Uh, yes, because he's the head of the agency. Well, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Let's see if we can now have Dr. David rejoin us if he has a better connection. And uh, we can see your visual is perfect. Let's check that we have good audio. Can you hear me now? 
Perfect. Nice to have you join the show, sir. Uh, let's get your thoughts on these developments. Dr. Steve has been very generous to establish a background to this conversation. We've also taken a listen to the outgoing DG of the NIA, Al-Haji Ahmed Abubakar Rufai, who had said it was based on personal reasons. But Dr. Steve is of the opinion that it might be related to the season of the Jets and the intelligence that failed to come in beforehand to avert that situation. What's your take on this? Well, uh, I, I didn't uh, get to hear his interventions, but I, I don't think it has uh, to do uh, with the season of the Jets. I, I think that it's more that these guys were supposed to have left some 15 months ago when all that services were changed. And the president that of his whole benevolence had just allowed them to stay. So they've stayed, they've stayed another 15 months after, um, after the fact that they were supposed to have, have moved on. But for, for, for Al-Haji Rufai, he has stayed with two presidents now. Are you saying that uh, the Muhammad Buhari administration also failed to have effected that change in that regard? There shouldn't really be controversy about all these things because the thing, uh, you are appointed, you have a time that is fixed for you to go, after the time you move on. And but because of the climb that we are in, um, this will generate... Um, they, they will generate a lot of issues, but for me, there's, there's nothing special about them leaving. You are appointed one day, and one day you have to leave. Now, Dr. Daniel, uh, Dr. David, rather, we'll look at a video and we'll come back to get your thoughts. Because this video has now gone viral. You say there shouldn't be controversies, but according to this video being circulated, staff of the DSS took to a celebration and a frenzy during working hours, viewing the resignation announcement on a TV, and uh, they were jubilating. We'll get your thoughts. Let's also share this video with our viewing audience this morning. This were moments following the announcement of the resignation as uh, posted in a publication by the official spokesman to the president, Chief Adjuri Ngelale. It's gone viral across social media. You can see reportedly staff of the DSS engaging in this frenzy at the office, chanting celebratory songs, and uh, somewhat being overjoyed about the news of the resignation of Brown, the outgone DG. Now, earlier on, uh, we had looked to review some of the operations of the DSS under his administration, but owing to your knowledge of uh, his expertise in office, uh, let us get perspectives on this development. What would you say the DSS under uh, Mr. Yusuf Magachi Bichi was like, and do you see any reason why the DSS staff were in that frenzy? Well, uh, if, if you follow the service under Bichi, Bichi has retired. Uh, he was brought in by the former president for his retirement to come and take over. He has literally put that service on the reverse gear. Mm -hmm. If you listen to, if you're close, you, you monitor what is happening, you know that staff discontent was so high. There was, the, the service is highly divided. Things were done not out of, um, not not because people deserve it, but because of where you come from, your religion, and some other considerations. And so a lot of the staff felt alienated. A few people were the ones that were favored and they get everything. And the majority got nothing. So it, they just bidding their time. People were praying, bidding their time when this, when you go. In fact, uh, within the service itself, people were just, uh, were just waiting that this day will come. And so when the day eventually came, I mean, people couldn't just allow the announcement to be made before they are rejoicing because it has been, let me not use the word oppressive, but it, it wasn't really uh, the best of times for the for the staff of uh, ATSS. Now let's uh, look to revisit some of the agenda settings a lot of persons would expect from the new appointees. Mm -hmm. For the DSS particularly in getting their house in order, much like you said in your review, what are your hopes for Ambassador Mohammed Mohammed? It is basically the same thing. You, you, you know the you know the issues that that have have happened with um, NIA. Um, initially, it was in the public, but later the public didn't get to hear much. But look, the same Nigerian factor affect every organization. You ask me to set agenda. We well, can set very beautiful agenda. We can say the man is going to do this. But when you get to the to hit the ground running, there, there you normally will find a lot of roadblocks. 
you can't move staff because there are interests. You can't post people as as per um, expediency. But there are interests that will say you cannot move this staff from here. You have to post this person here. Even in the other services, you find politicians intervening or influencing postings, trainings, uh, policies. So, so even if you set those uh, agenda, the environment is key. The environment within which these guys are supposed to work. When I talk about the environment, I'm talking about the Nigerian environment, the political environment, the social environment, the cultural environment, the power play environment that limits officers of law, that limit appointees of government from doing what is right. So you set agenda, the man gets there, and uh, there are all sorts of book with traps and uh, blockade. But, but if you ask me what they should do within the context of the available space they are given, the two services need complete overhaul. The DSS is on its, on its nails because of, of the way it has been run over the past couple of years. DNA is the same thing. So, so where they need to start? It, it, and the good thing about this now is that they were, they were um, serving personnel of the, within the system. So they understood what the problems are. And hopefully they will get the cooperation of the political establishment and their own colleagues to be able to bring the uh, changes that is required. But, but the greatest change that they need to require to do is the internal restructuring, internal, um, internal restructuring, if you like, uh, changes need to happen, fundamental surgical changes need to happen internally before you can even talk of going outside because the house that is on fire, a house that is not um, at peace with itself, like you saw those staff, you will have asked yourself, those kind of persons are working in an office, they are completely dissatisfied, so how do you expect that organization to be? Incidentally, we do not have the opportunity to see the reaction of uh, the NIA person, but I know that the number, quite a number, were not happy because, in terms of postings and promotions, junior staff were promoted above uh, senior staff, and people were preferentially posted to juicy places. And so there, there, there was a lot of discontent in the two, uh, in the two organizations. If I, if you interacted with the DSS people, uh, uh, staff before now, you will know that openly, openly, they had, uh, people had complained about the things that were not going on. So like for me, both uh, Ajayi and uh, Mohammed, uh, the first thing they need to do is to put their house in order because a house that is divided against itself, that we always say will not um, make any progress. So the first thing to do really is to sit down with their own staff, have, a, have a, a, a town hall, talk to the personnel, and ask the way forward. They should, be able to, they should carry everybody along. We have issues. We have national security concerns. And those issues will not go away tomorrow because those issues are within the context or within the, the periphery of political decisions. The, the crisis, security crisis you see, very small part of it is, is, is security is, um, for law enforcement agency. It is the failure of governance, the failure of government actions, the failure of the ministries, department and agency, the failure of national aspect, the failure of civil governance that results in putting pressure on the security because if there is misgovernance, things go wrong and then you are called on the security to come and take over to make changes. How do you, what do you want, what, what are they supposed to be doing with a country where people are hungry and angry and frustrated and desperate? Bombs and class and detentions cannot stop people. What can stop people is effective governance action. That is what will reduce the pressure on the security. I mean, pressure, if you mount pressure on the security, they will buckle and fail. But if the other arms of government will play their role, then Rufa and Mohammed and the um, and the Ajayi can, can 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 be able to work. But if Nigeria remains the way it is, where like I said, everybody is at the end of their characters. Now, now, Doctor David. My son, now, Doctor David, you made particular mention of some internal house cleaning that is needed. But uh, I'd like you to also look at it from this perspective that even in the Nigerian police force, the working relationship with the police service commission, in terms of what you say is a promotion of uh, junior staff ahead of senior staff, and this has led to the discontent in both of these outfits. It's almost seemingly uh, impossible to dis dis disassociate this influence that informs the appointment of certain individuals into leadership positions in agencies even when you have say the police service commission saddled with such responsibilities of promotion these interferences still find a way to raise ugly head 
how do you advise that such interferences and due promotions based on merit and performance be awarded to strengthen institutions, especially in regards to our fights against insecurity in Nigeria? Look, uh, both Ajayi, uh, Mr. Ajayi and Mr. Mohammed, people influenced their appointments. People put in the word for them. People spoke for them. People did all sorts of things for them. So it's normal when they get to power, when they come to the office, those people, they, they say they want the person who pays the pipe, pay the tell the tune. So this is the crisis that we have, that, they are, that you have to manage influence. There is a lot of influence and interested parties. If an email calls you and say post XYZ director to KB State, you, and you can't say no. Or if a, a, some political juggernaut calls you and, and you know that they have the capacity to determine your remaining in that position or getting or being able to run the position, you have no option. So, like I said, um, it, it is it's not just the police service commission that, that that was a terrible case because several times I was on television with their people and there was this fight back and forth. But, but, but like I said, the issue of who goes where, for instance, uh, state governors determine who get posted to their state, it, it, it's not based on professionalism or what the service think is best. The state governors will say, look, I don't want this guy. This is the person I want. And these are the, we are turning this entire thing on its head, which will allow competence, which will allow professionalism, which will allow national interest. The, the way we are, I, I, that even as far as the judiciary, that judges are not appointed except by influence from the villa or from the power that be of the political past. So the same thing is happening everywhere. So a judge who is appointed because of his relationship with, um, with, uh, or he has been, he has been nominated by the political establishment. Where do they are, they, are, they are bidding? The same thing with these guys that have been appointed. They will take instructions from people they are not supposed to take instructions from. Now, Dr. David, your colleague, Dr. Steve, is in the studio as well. Let me come to him. I'll come back to you and we'll get your perspectives from the <coughs> insecurity situations peculiar to certain regions and what you advise the district outfits can do. Now, having listened to Dr. David, mm. he has highlighted on due influence of the political juggernauts and bigwigs. Yeah. And he says it's almost impossible to divorce this from the Nigerian state. Now, some of this influences in terms of response to challenges within certain states as well have also been characterized as factors mitigating against actively tackling issues of insecurity at the root cause. Care to lend any thoughts to this development? Yeah, you see, when we, when we allow uh, politics to infiltrate into the security sector in Nigeria, I think that's the point we, we missed it. Uh, Dr. Cole talked about uh, people not professionally posted or deployed to occupy certain offices, and that's what we are seeing at, uh, at play. You know, I think, I think that is where we miss it. Everything about security now in Nigeria has become political. You know, even appointments, you know, the, the, it's the president's prerogative to appoint whoever he wants to appoint. And um, for the NIA DG and the DG of DSS, for them to have spent 15 months when their other colleagues, like the service chiefs, left immediately president, uh, Tinubu was sworn in. He knew that they were, the, the, the report about them was, was fair. He knew they were, they were delivering. Otherwise, if they were not delivering, if the report about them was not fair enough, I don't think the president would have kept them to serve for another 15 months in his government. You know, So I, I just want to react to that uh, video about uh, the man's exit. You see, when you come into a system and you have your principle and all that, and this is what you, the way you want to run, the, your administration has had, it is not everybody that will like it. Some people, when you, when you go the other, the other way, you, know, you see some people feeling bad that the man has left. You must have to work with certain people. You know, in the event where you left, and this the new guy is coming in. But that, that's the way he, uh, Dr. Koro said, some people spoke on their behalf for them to be appointed as DGs. You know, as the man is coming in now to become DG or has become DG, also personalized in this uh, various uh, uh, institutions or agencies. I also want them to work very closely with the man. The man will definitely come with his own uh, uh, team, you know, from amongst uh, the service to see how to, to deliver, you know. So in the event where one or two people love and they don't get, for instance, they will go back and begin to cast the man. So all these things are, are, 
are, are possible to see in the system, you know. So for me, uh, uh, I just told you the rules of uh, the DSS, you know, to protect the Federal Republic of Nigeria against the domestic threats and gather the code intelligence for the basic intelligence. Now, this is our, our next subject of conversation. Yeah. Once you get your thoughts on this, let's also bring in Dr. David as well. Mm. Uh, Dr. David, uh, if you do us the honor of speaking on this next issue, because uh, there have been some widely speculated assertions that the resignation of uh, al Haji Rufai was not also unlinked to the hashtag end bad governance protest. They said that the DSS ought to have preferred more intelligence to forestall some breakdown of law and order in states, uh, along with the protests which we've seen the protest organizers also issuing a 17-point ultimatum to the federal government this morning. Let's get your thoughts on this. No, but I, I've told you, I said, um, look, the, the truth is this. When people talk about intelligence failure, intelligence failure, the truth is that the intelligence community usually provides intelligence actionable intelligence it is what the politicians so the political head do with those information or do with intelligence that is the issue they were they had if you if you go to nnc or you go to any of the security agencies you know they provide abundant research information or, 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 or intelligence that can be acted upon now, now dr david we can hear you quite clearly but we can't quite see you you're talking about intelligence gathering Check that your visual is on and then pick it up from there. Okay, okay. So I, I, my video will be on in a minute, but if you can hear me, the point I was making is that when, they are, when people accuse the intelligence community of not doing enough, it is because they don't understand the working on that uh, sector. Information is provided, timely intelligence is provided, but the actioning of it, the, 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 the operationalizing of it, the uh, the use of those intelligence that's where the issues are so it, it's not because it can't be because uh, all right we'll come back to you once you have your video and audio well sorted out but uh he's talked about mm. timely provision of intelligence yes. slow response time from the mm -hmm. agencies security architecture cyber to combat some of those threats yes. do you much agree with him <coughs> yeah you see um to respond to this i will take you to the crime triangle the tri crime triangle talks about desire, opportunity, and reward. Now, if an, a criminal intended Nigerian wants to commit crime, he conceives it. As the person is conceiving it, the law enforcement agents are not aware that he's conceiving the act that he wants to go and commit crime, right? Now, what the law enforcement agents or agencies are supposed to do is that the opportunity to be able to commit the crime shouldn't be there. So the event where the person wants to exhibit or commit that crime, the law enforcement now is now to see that uh, they stop the person from having the opportunity to commit the crime. You know, and that is where the uh, law enforcement agents and agencies are failing. The criminal elements have a fertile ground to commit this crime. And that's the opportunity they have when we're talking about the crime triangle. In the event where they succeed, they get the reward. You understand? So if a kidnapper, for instance, wants to go and kidnap, and the person doesn't have the opportunity in the event of trying to strike to take away the, the, the victim, and law enforcement acts based on intelligence, and they act swiftly, and they get there, the criminal-minded person that won't succeed, right? So it means the, the opportunity has been thwarted, right? But in the event where the criminal-minded person succeeds and takes away the victim, and uh, some form of negotiation, either monetary or otherwise, is achieved. That's the reward now. You know, so these three things in trying to see how to go forward or move forward with our security agencies, they must have to look at the crime triangle. triangle. Now, Dr. Steve has prescribed a look at the crime triangle and responding to domestic insecurity in five minutes as we look to wrap up with you this morning and allow you to get back to your order of the day. Let's look at the international scene on the responsibility of the NIA in checkmating some of the security threats. Now, from the angle of financing for terrorism, which has been tied to the proceeds of illegal mining being repatriated out of the country, we did see uh, reports as well a couple of months back on a certain amount of humongous dollars that are being taken out of Nigeria 
that have been tied to financing of terrorism? How does the NIA, during it, under its new leadership, uh, look to tackle this in your perspective, Doctor? Well, well, like I said, the NIA is not a responding agency. It's an intelligence agency. They provide information and that information is supposed to be responded upon by the responding agency and government. The NSC could well have told the government who the financials of terrorism are, and government refused to act on it. So it, it, it's not the, the challenge, it's not the problem of uh, the intelligence agency, it's the problem of who uses and how those information are used. Because, for instance, we are aware that countries like the United Arab Emirates had at different times told us who the financial of terrorism were in Nigeria and, and no action was ever taken. But I haven't said that. There are critical roles that N N NI should play. They are, apart from uh, giving early warning or information or intelligence about the intentions of our enemies, they can also help with aspect of um, uh, economic intelligence. They can provide those timely and useful intelligence that will help our our businesses are help government to make policies. Now, now, Dr. David, in terms of the economic outlook for certain states in Nigeria, there's been a recurrent conversation about intelligence to aid with the repatriation of Simon Ekpa back to Nigeria to face charges for certain crimes with the enforcement of sit at home every Monday in the Southeast. Is there a role the NIA can play in this? No, uh, it's a diplomatic, that's a, clearly a diplomatic uh, issue. Uh, NIA will, can only provide you it uh, undercover what is making this man to do what he's doing, who are those supporting him. But then there's supposed to be the diplomatic uh, action from there. The government is supposed to take firm diplomatic action because what is happening uh, in many of our international relations is unacceptable. For instance, we've had uh, arms and ammunition being imported from Turkey, you know, in large quantities, yeah, 600. Uh, pump action rifles, this, this from Turkey, and Nigerian government have never done anything about it. Even when the NSA provides from uh, the intelligence, government doesn't seem to be acting on it. The ones we have seen, nothing has happened. If a, a country consistently is a source of weapons that come into your country, it's an enemy nation. Uh, the country where Empire is by now, the co Nigerian government should have called its ambassador because that's an act of aggression against Nigeria. But yet, you see that no action has been taken. It is not a naive um, um, meeting. It is for the diplomatic arm of government to uh, to, to strike and uh, to, to be able to give a, a money to other countries that if you have people like Epa, this is what Nigeria would do. But we are laid back. We are not for that because of uh, whatever reasons that uh, nobody knows. But, so it's not, a, it's not the intelligence community. They provide all that you want. It is the action. Now, th thank you, Dr. David, for straightening out these responsibilities of the agencies that are concerned. In a minute, as you say your goodbyes, because uh, I'm afraid this is as much as we can take from you, what's your hope for inter-sister agency relationship better under the two DGs? Well, they have to work together because there is no, there is not as if it's a completely clear demarcation between the external national security and internal national security. It, 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 it sometimes it misses because sometimes you have information, the external information. I want to follow up in Nigeria. You have threats that you have detected in in UK or somewhere. You have to follow up in Nigeria. I have issues internal, international security in Nigeria. So there is a a, a meeting point. In fact, in the NSC's office, there's what we call the Intelligence Fusion Center. So there is a meeting point where everybody comes together to work. But like, like I said, it is critically necessary that the about 70 odd or so intelligence uh, members of the Nigeria intelligence community should work together. And and the better they work together, the more they work together, the better for us. These differences are there, but it, it should be in the terms of national interest that they must work together. And I know that because they are colleagues, they are trained together, they have met in uh, programs together, they have done all sorts of things together. I believe they will be able to work together for the betterment of Nigeria going forward. But well, again, they really, really, it depends on what do Nigerians want. And it, the government will always respond to what the people want. So it depends on what do the citizens demand from their, from their representative, what do they demand from the appointees of the government. If the citizens say this is the direction we want, they cannot go otherwise. They will have a dormant and a very relaxed citizenship. And this is the reason why we are here. We are. But I hope that Nigerians will come out now and let these guys know this is what we want and, and, and so that they can go in that direction. Thank you very much, Dr. David Okoro, for taking our time to grace the program this morning. We appreciate your objectivity.
Thank you very much. My pleasure always. Now I'm back to you, Dr. Steve, when in the next five minutes we should be rounding up. He has left his comments with a charge to the Office of the Citizen. Now the challenges with the Office of the Citizen is the constitutional provisions for citizens to have a voice. Mm. In recent time, we've seen this voice metamorphosed into the hashtag end bad governance protests, mm. which has gone sour. This morning, we saw 17 points ultimatum issued to the federal government ahead of the October showdown. How does the Office of the Citizen Owing to the call from Dr. David, keep government on its oars of maintaining security, which is one of its primary functions. Exactly. You have said it is the primary responsibility of government and its constitution to provide security for Nigerians and even the uh, foreigners that are here. Now, the office of the citizens, the only way they can vent their anger in when certain policies of government is not consistent with their needs is to only protest, you know. And in protesting, they must see that they do it according to the laws and order of the land, you know. Now, the, the only way they can draw government attention is just the way I said, is to protest. And it's not for the government to begin to see how to cage them, you know. Cage them in a place, the government won't feel the heat, you know, when they are caged in a place. But you don't still blame the government for caging them in a place, because we have seen uh, the other issues that come out of this protest when they allow them to go on the street, you know. Uh, we saw what played out, looted properties of government and uh, private individuals, destruction of, of pu public and private uh, properties as well. And as well, they, some lives were lost, you know. So, in the event of protesting, of course we agree with me that protest is constitutional as well, you know. So, you must have to see that you do it according to the yeah, laws of the law. Yes. Now, on the other angle of community policing, because I'm, I'm being reminded that we have just a minute or two to wrap up. Okay. It, it's community policing from the angle of communities where citizens can play a role mm -hmm. in setting the agenda for our new security outlook. Yeah, you see, I have said it times without number that citizens are also security managers. The, the, the law enforcement agents are not ghosts. It, it's not possible for you to find them everywhere. You know, so. Uh, the role of community policing uh, is uh, a, 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 an opportunity where citizens of certain communities or certain areas interact with our law enforcement agents. You know, have a, a way that you interact with uh, the police, the DSS, and the other security agencies. Now, the question is: When we were growing up, we used to see that the we used to see where the police carry out a foot patrol. You know, they come to a certain community, park their vehicle work within the community, interact with the people and all that. Are we seeing that now? We're not seeing it anymore. So how has the police and the other law enforcement, how have they established means or mode of communication between the agencies and the community? You know, so there's a whole lot that we need to do beyond using budgets or telephone to make this uh, established communication. I think there's need for our law enforcement agents to see how to carry out and back on foot patrol. You know, so that as you interact with members of the community, you will know they are setting their security challenges. If they see suspects of uh, suspect people that are coming to their community that are strange to them, they can pass this information to the police. Now, beyond that, uh, the trust in even telling the police that uh, we see somebody that is suspicious and all that, have you have you been able to establish that trust between the police and the people? You know, because there's this trust deficit. We are seeing situations where people tell police, give police some information, or they serve as informants. I don't know what they do. When these uh, people are arrested, they go after the, the individuals or group of people that gave the police information about them. So the police needs to be that confident so that Nigerians also have that trust in them that in the event where they see something and they let the police know, it should be, it should be confidential. But we're not 